This is a special report from ABC News Digital. Hello, everyone. I'm Tanya Rivero in New York for an ABC News Digital special report. A flood of new details about the Boston Marathon bombing suspects today. A grand jury handed up a 75-page, 30-count indictment against Jahar Zarnayev today, the surviving suspect in the bombings. Boston law enforcement officials are right now giving a briefing. We're going to go to that right now. Resulting in personal injury and death, as well as maliciously destroying property, resulting in personal injury and causing death and use of a firearm during and in relation to a crime of violence, including using a firearm to cause death. Carjacking resulting in serious bodily injury and interfering with commerce by threats and violence. The indictment contains detailed factual allegations about the defendant's alleged conduct and role in the crimes that have been charged. According to the indictment, Zokar Sanayev and his brother Tamalin took steps before April 15th to prepare for that, their actions that day. Among them, on or about March 20th, the defendant and his brother traveled to a firing range in Manchester, New Hampshire, where Zokar Sanayev rented two 9mm handguns, purchased 200 rounds of ammunition, and engaged in target practice. On or about April 5th, Tamerlan Sanayev ordered electronic components on the internet that could be adapted for use in making IEDs and had them shipped to the Cambridge residence that he shared with his brother, Zokar. The defendant also downloaded a publication that provided instructions on how to build a bomb. And the day before the bombing, the defendant opened a prepaid cell phone account number in the name of Jahar Sarnai. According to the indictment, on April 15th, at approximately 2.40 p.m., Tamil and Sunai have placed a backpack in front of 671 Boylston Street, where Marathon Sports is located, among a dense crowd of marathon spectators. The backpack contained an IED constructed from a pressure cooker, low explosive powder, shrapnel, adhesive, electronic components, and other items. At the same time, Zokar Sanayev walked to 755 Boylston Street in front of the Forum restaurant, where he also placed a backpack containing a similar kind of IED among another crowd of marathon spectators, including dozens of men, women, and children. According to the indictment at approximately 2.48 p.m., Zokar Sanayev called his brother using his prepaid cell phone and spoke to him for several seconds. Seconds after the call, Tamalin Tsarnaev detonated the bomb that he had placed in front of Marathon Sports. And after that bomb exploded, it, among many things, it killed Crystal Marie Campbell and it also maimed and seriously injured many others. Seconds later, after the first explosion, Sokar Tsarnaev detonated the bomb that he had placed in front of the farm restaurant. And when that bomb exploded, it killed Lingzi Lu and Martin Richard, and it also maimed and seriously injured many others that were in that area. The indictment further alleges that on April 18th, a few hours after the media began disseminating photographs of the Sarnayev brothers identifying them as potential suspects in the marathon bombing, Zokar and Tamerlan armed themselves with five IEDs a Ruger 9mm semi-automatic handgun, ammunition, a machete, and a hunting knife, and drove their Honda Civic to MIT in Cambridge. When they arrived at the school, the defendant and his brother murdered MIT police officer Sean Collier, shooting him in the head at close range with the 9mm semi-automatic handgun. They also attempted to steal his weapon. Following Officer Collier's murder, Zokar and Tamalin Tsarnaev carjacked an individual who is referred to in the indictment as DM and who was in a Mercedes. And they carjacked him by pointing a gun and threatening to kill him. They indicated to the victim that they intended to drive his vehicle to Manhattan. Zokar and Tamalin forced DM to drive to Watertown where they retrieved a portable GPS device and other items from their Honda Civic 
and then forced Diem to drive to a service station to get gas. While they were searching for a gas station, they drove Diem to a Bank of America ATM in Watertown Square and forced him to hand over his debit card and personal identification number. Sokar Sanayev then used this debit card and withdrew $800 from the victim's bank account. At around 12.15 a.m. on April 19th, while the defendant and his brother were stopped, had stopped for gas, the victim escaped from the Mercedes and called 911. After the victim escaped, Sokar and Tamerlan Sanayev drove to Laurel Street in Watertown where police located them and tried to apprehend them. It was at this time that the Sarnayev brothers began firing at the officers. The Sarnayev brothers used four IEDs against them, one of which was made from a pressure cooker, low explosive powder, powder, shrapnel, and other items. After attempting to shoot, bomb, and kill or disable the officers who were trying to apprehend him, Zokar Sanayev drove directly at Watertown officers Jeffy Pugliesi, John McClellan, and John Reynolds. When Sarkayev, Zokar Sanayev drove at the officers, he barely missed Sergeant Jeffrey Pugliesi, who was attempting to drag Tamerlan Sanayev to safety. Zokar Sanayev drove over his brother Tamerlan, seriously injuring him and contributing to his death. In the course of making his escape, Zokar Sanayev also caused Richard Donahue, a Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority officer, to sustain serious bodily injury. Sanayev later abandoned the car on Spruce Street in Watertown, smashing both of his cell phones and hid in a dry docked boat in a Watertown backyard until he was captured by the police. As a result of the charges that have been filed today, the defendant faces up to life and possibly death if convicted. I do want to say that I have met with several of those that were injured on April 15th, as well as members of the deceased families. I was able to hear the, their thoughts, uh, discuss the process moving forward, and learn a bit about them personally. Their strength is extraordinary, and we will do everything that we can to pursue justice, not only on their behalf, but on behalf of, of all of us. And we've just been hearing from Boston law enforcement officials detailing Definitely. some aspects of the 75-page, 30-count indictment against Jahar Zarnayev, the surviving suspect in the Boston Marathon bombings. Some of the new details to emerge today include how the Zarnayev brothers allegedly carried out the very coordinated bombings and then the murder of Officer Sean Collier. Right now, I want to bring in ABC's Pierre Thomas as well as ABC's Aaron Katursky, who both had a chance to look at some of the documents. Pierre, what new details? details have we learned from this indictment? Well, a couple things struck me about the indictment. One is the, to, the degree to which the suspects were radicalized online. Uh, we're getting information that they learned how to make the bomb from uh, downloading information from Inspire magazine, which is an online publication from Al Qaeda, that they ordered their components online. Also, that uh, they were inspired by uh, the writings of Anwar al-Awlaki, the radical cleric that the U.S. killed in a drone uh, attack uh, some time ago. But again, he again appears to be able to inspire from the grave. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like a half a dozen cases or so that we've seen where al-Awlaki is inspiring uh, radicals from the grave. And the other thing I would add is that confrontation with police that killed the older brother. Uh, we're learning that they actually had a hand-to-hand -hand combat with the, the older brother after he allegedly shot at them and threw bombs at them, and that they were trying to basically drag him from the scene when the younger brother ran him over. Mm. Uh, again, critical, dramatic details. Absolutely. And Aaron, tell us, no other suspects have been named. Is that right? These brothers seem to have been acting alone? It's not for lack of looking, Tanya. The authorities have been back and forth to a number of uh, states and, and different countries, uh, interviewing uh, potential suspects, looking for any kind of connections, particularly overseas uh, terror-related connections. But it does appear that the Sarnayev brothers were uh, first, as Pierre notes, radicalized via the Internet and acted alone. And it goes through, the indictment does, in some uh, rather specific detail about where they obtained certain components for not only the 
the, the bombs, but where they obtain their ammunition, where they obtain uh, fireworks and gunpowder. And so it does appear, as hard as it was to believe, at least at the outset, that the Tsarnaev brothers did act alone. And Pierre, we're also learning that they practiced on gun ranges. Is that correct? That's, that's new information, isn't it? Yes, uh, it says that sometime in March they went to a, uh, a gun range to do some shooting, I believe that's the date. Uh, again, practicing how to use firearms. Um, you know, again, the FBI continues an extensive international investigation, particularly in Russia, to see if the older brother Zarniov uh, got any support uh, from uh, radicals overseas. Uh, if you look at the indictment, there's no evidence that shows that he got that uh, support. Again, the investigation is still ongoing, but to date, if you look at the indictment, it looks like these were two young men who were radicalized online and carried out an attack. Now, this is something that law enforcement has been long concerned about, the so-called lone wolf effect, that people could be sitting in the basement of their homes and learn how to become terrorists. And yet it also seems that there was a very short period of time, correct, between when the bombers got this radical information and when they actually carried out the attack. Yeah, if you look at the indictment, it says that they began planning at least in February. So if you look at from February to April when the attacks uh, were carried out, that's not that long a period of time. Uh, to hatch and develop and execute a plot. Is that, I mean, do law enforcement officials tell you that that is sort of a, a usual length of time for people that get radicalized themselves in their basement, or does it usually take a little bit longer than that? There's, there's nothing set in stone. Um, they brought numerous cases uh, involving stings, involving people who were radicalized online that they got word of, uh, information about and heretofore before Boston they had typically been capturing people before they could actually do uh, an attack. Now in a number of these cases the people thought they were actually launching attacks when in fact they were talking to undercover FBI agents but in this case the FBI had a lead on uh, Zarniev uh, earlier uh, dropped the case after they could not develop additional information that he was actually doing a terrorist act. Uh, he goes to Russia comes back home, they don't follow up at that point, and again, in that period from when he returned from Russia, again, from February to April, they say, uh, he developed this plot. So much damage in such a short period of time. Now, Aaron, we're also getting more information about what was written on the boat Jahar was hiding in before he was apprehended. Some are saying it almost amounts to a confession. Well, because he speaks to the notion that America is killing innocents uh, abroad. And, and if you stop doing this, uh, we'll stop doing this. Uh, not a direct quote, but a, a summation of what was scrawled in the boat where Johar Tsarnaev was hiding in the hours before he was, uh, well, he really fell uh, out of the boat as state police hovered above using infrared camera equipment to detect any particular movement. Such a dramatic end uh, to, to a, a capture that, that for a little a while seemed like it would never come. And remember, as Pierre says, that this all started in February 2013, according to court records. And the initial target, we were told, was perhaps the, the July 4th uh, fireworks on the Esplanade along the Charles River in Boston. Uh, and ultimately, the plan took a little bit uh, less time than the brothers perhaps thought. And so they decided on the marathon attack, we've been told. But the July 4th event on the Esplanade, which is going to go off in Boston this year, is under intense security this time. State police put out special instructions for anyone going. So even as this case now moves forward as a, as a regular old uh, criminal prosecution, there are special steps being taken as a result of this, uh, of this pl uh, marathon attack. And even today, you heard, Tanya, the, the director of the FBI thank the people of Boston. Remember, the investigation shut down a major American city and surrounding suburbs. Absolutely, for several days. All right, ABC's Aaron Katursky and Pierre Thomas, thanks to both of you for being with us. And for more on the latest developments in the Boston Marathon bombing indictments, you can go to abcnews.com. I'm Tanya Rivero in New York, and this has been an ABC News Digital Special Report. This has been a special report from ABC News Digital.